Hello, it's Barry Nussbaum with the American Truth Project. We're spending a couple minutes today with San Diego Congressman Duncan Hunter, who has just returned from Israel and can give us a front seat analysis of the status of the Middle East and the level of defense cooperation between the United States and Israel. Thanks for joining us, Congressman. Great to be with you. So tell us about uh, your trip to Israel. Uh, what is it that uh, you can tell our people that uh, they don't know yet? Having oh. you been on the front lines as a Marine and a U.S. Congressman, having given that tour from uh, what I assume is uh, the heads of the Israeli military. Yeah, it was, uh, the, the Israelis are fighting for their survival and uh, they're, they're surrounded on all sides. But it's interesting, I mean, you have Egypt is actually taking care of, of ISIS and the uh, Sinai, and their message on, on Egypt was quit, uh, quit asking for democracy in, in Egypt, it's going okay right now, they're, they're really helping. Syria is a mess, and they're an absolute mess, and they're praying that Jordan stays intact and does not fall. Uh, they're, they're surrounded on all sides, but they're preparing. And, uh, you know, at, at some point, the flashpoint's going to be reached, and, and bad things are going to start happening, and the, the key is that they can defend themselves, and not just defend themselves, but attack and, and go on offense. Because uh, at some point, dialogue stops working and talking stops working. And it's hard for Americans to understand that people in the, in the Middle East are not uh, part of Western civilization. They don't have the same values that we do. I'm talking about the Islamic uh, uh, regimes in Syria and Iraq and Jordan and Egypt, just the entire area. They don't have the same values as we do. They don't work things out the same way that we do. They understand power. Uh, and Israel's got to stay powerful, and that's where America can help. So from our perspective here in the United States, the Islamic State is way over there. From the Israeli point of view, we spoke earlier today with the uh, general in charge of uh, helicopter brigades right. in Israel, and he says ISIS is right on the border now. Right. Did you get a sense of that when you were yeah, just there in Israel? Uh, yeah, we, well, I went up to the Syrian border by myself uh, with some military folks, and we we actually saw the fighting in, in Syria, you can see, right on the border. And what the Israelis have done is pull, pull back from the border so they, there won't be any incidents. Uh, being, but there's, there's literally uh, there's people farming the fields up to the border fence with Syria where you can see the machine gun fire and, and bombs and mortars going off, at, I mean, live during the day. It's, it's, a, it's amazing that people can even live under, under that kind of stress or I, I guess it's like anything, you get used to it. It's like a, a loud train going by your, your house every night, you get used to that noise, and they're, they're able to live life um, and, and always being ready in a second's notice to defend themselves. It's amazing, and it just shows great character and perseverance and the ability to exist and have a normal life when you're surrounded by all sides. So but here at home, we're, we're getting the story, Congressman, that ISIS is under control and we're taking the fight to ISIS and they're actually somewhat in retreat and we're gaining ground. Did you get a sense of that being in Israel? No. Not well, at all. Because, it's not, you because it's not just ISIS. What, what, what we, the uh, sense in Syria and Iraq was there's so many factions now. There's of Nusra. In fact, the, uh, there's like 20 different factions that I, I can't name off, but the Israelis can. But they're all fighting. So it's, it's not just ISIS. It's, even if ISIS goes away, there's, you're, you're, it's going to splinter off in, into different groups too and they're going to have the same Al-Qaeda mentality or ISIS mentality, that's not going to change. So just e even if ISIS gets beat and pushed out of their area, uh, that doesn't fix Syria in any way at all. It, that doesn't fix Iraq in any way at all. Uh, there's, there's just uh, there's too many factions all vying for control now, all armed, um, a lot of them trained by, by either us or, or ISIS or the Syrians. Um, you have, you have uh, Lebanon. And, his, his bala is, you know, frankly, it's not a bad thing for Israel. Just speaking in Israeli terms, it's not a bad thing that they're all fighting. Because for once, as the Israelis said, it's finally not a Jewish problem. <laughs> finally not us, right? They're, they're fighting amongst themselves. And, and that, that gives Israel a time to, to, to uh, you know, breathe and take stock and plan for what they have to do militarily. Uh, and, and that's beyond the dealing with, with Gaza and, and, and the West Bank. Um, that's all about ex external threats. It's a, it's a crazy era. So from an American perspective, what could we be doing uh, for foreign policy that we are not doing to help stabilize that area and hold the tide against what's going on? Uh, helping the Egyptians, helping Sisi in, in Egypt, helping uh, Jordan stay stable. If, if Jordan falls, 
Israel's got an entire eastern flank that'll be wide open, that they'll have to secure the border the way they have to, to secure the border to Gaza and, and their other borders. So, I mean, try, trying to keep Jordan stable, the, the U.S. can really help with that, and the U.S. does, but it could probably do, do more. So, uh, same with Egypt. And, and quit asking for democracy in countries that are not ready for democracy, just for the sake of uh, kind of an I idealistic a academic approach to foreign policy is saying, why can't everybody be like we are here? Right? Because they can't. They're, right. not, they're, they're not ready for it, they're not mature enough as nations, and frankly, their, their, their religion doesn't match the type of, of government that we think that people should have. It just does not work. Um, so I think those are a few things that the U.S. can do, and, and obviously keep supplying Israel with, with, with arms and, uh, and foreign aid, which the Israelis use to buy U.S. Uh, defense systems. Just keep on kind of doing what we're doing and make, making sure people know, making sure that the people who surround Israel know that if, if, if they touch Israel, then they're, they're uh, touching America too. So let's talk about that and from a political sense, Congressman. If there's a change in the White House uh, in November and someone new steps in in January, let's say it's the man you're backing, which is Donald Trump, sure. will there be uh, a difference in change with Israel from an American point of view? I don't think you know, there will be better relations politically because right, right now you have great military relations no matter who the president is, whether it's a far left liberal president or a, a far right conservative president, that military to military cooperation and friendship, that'll exist no matter what. So, and, and that's frankly what's important. Um, at, at the, the, the uh, political level, I think it'll be much better. And frankly, no matter which, which, uh, which party wins this election at the presidential level, I think you'll have better relations, whether it's Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or, or Cruz or whoever, you'll have better relations than, you, than they've had for eight years politically. All right, Absolutely. so if you could wave a magic wand and let's say we'll leave politics out of it, what policy change would you hope would happen in the Middle East from a United States point of view? What would you make different if you could? So I went through both. Um, I was in Iraq twice, 2003 and 2004. We took Fallujah. I was there for that. Then I went to Afghanistan and served in 07 as a uh, as a Marine. Here, here's what I've what I figured out. Here's here's the biggest policy change that I would make. No more sticking around and trying to build mosques and schools and, and help and and, and a, a new sewer system and an electrical grid. It's kind of it's kind of interesting. I, it, there's it's analogous with what Israel's tried to do with. With the uh, West Bank and Gaza, they, they said, "Here, we're, we're, we're going to help. We're going to help, right? We're going to give you electricity. We're going to we're going to give you clean water, and it doesn't work." I mean, the people there didn't say, oh, "That's that's great. Thank you so much. We're going to stop trying to uh, kill you." But that that didn't happen. It's a, it's the same thing I think all over the Middle East. So the one policy change that I would make is go in, kick ass, and then leave, and and sit right outside and say, "If you do this again, we're going to we'll be back. We're going to crush you, and we're not going to stick around this time." We're not, we're not going to have bases where you can blow us up with improvised explosive devices driving around. We're not going to be there for that. We're going to sit right offshore, and if you mess with us, we're going to mess with you back really hard. We're, we're going to slap you down. But if you want to be friends, then we're, we're happy to be friends. We have, we have the greatest economy in the world. We're happy to bring you into that if you just want to be friends. So, so stop trying to kill good people for no reason except for radical extremist uh, religious uh, beliefs. And let, let's all be, be uh, friends. But if you're not going to be friends, then you're going to be our enemy straight up. And we're going to crush you. Got we're going to crush you. Thanks for your time and thank you for your service. Thank you.